No smartphones, that sounds like a nightmare for some of us. So you can imagine the four siblings, they got bored very quickly out of their minds. So in order to pass the time, they had to come up with creative ways to have fun together. So one day, they decide to play hide and seek. And during this game of hide and seek, the youngest of the four siblings, Lucy, she hid in a wardrobe, which is another word for just a big closet where you just open the doors and you can hang coats in it. And she hides in it only to find out that as she steps backwards, there's no back wall, but she steps into the magical world of Narnia. So the wardrobe was a portal or a gateway into this magical world. And she spends hours exploring, but then she leaves when all of a sudden she realizes her siblings must be worried about her. So she then comes out back out of the wardrobe into her world. And then she comes out but she realizes no time passed at all. Even though she was in the Narnia for a couple hours, only a couple seconds passed in the real world. And she came out and she was caught immediately by her siblings, but she doesn't care about being caught because she just saw something so amazing. And she starts telling her brothers and sister about her adventure, about the people she met, about the creatures she saw. And they don't believe her, and understandably so. If anyone came to us saying, if you go into a closet and there's another world in there, you'd think they're crazy. So we can understand where they're coming from. But like any person who is convinced of what they believe, she tries to prove herself. She takes them to the wardrobe, and she tries to show them the back of the wardrobe, only to see that it's changed back to a normal wardrobe. There is a back wall. So Lucy starts pleading with them and begging with them that they have to believe her. Now, one detail the author, C.S. Lewis, he makes is that Lucy always tells the truth. She's known for telling the truth. And besides the wardrobe being normal, if you consider that Lucy always tells the truth, all other evidence pointed to Lucy being genuine. She was young. So she probably couldn't have been losing her memory or sense of reality. She was crying, so she couldn't have been pulling a prank because of how serious she was being. She really believed what she was saying. And finally, she was known for always telling the truth, so she couldn't have been lying, at least not intentionally. And yet, even after all these things, her siblings refused to believe her. When it came to trusting their sister, even with all the evidence in front of them, the other siblings were faithless. They lacked faith in their sister, Lucy. And this is the situation Jesus finds himself in in our passage today. So let's consider all that Jesus did up to this point in Mark. Jesus healed many people, not just to demonstrate compassion, but to show that he has authority over all of creation, including sickness and demons. He preached with authority, not the authority of man, but literally the authority of God saying things that only God could say, like he forgives people of their sins. He did many miracles. He calmed a storm with just a word. He fed thousands of people with just five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish. He didn't come out and publicly declare to everyone that he is the son of God that Israel was waiting for, but all the signs were there. All the signs pointed to him being that guy. And yet, we'll see in our passage today that even after all the things he's done and all the things he said, there are people who still lack faith in him. They're faithless. And today, we're going to see how Jesus relates to such faithless people. And maybe here today, you may be thinking to yourself, you struggle in your faith, or it's hard for you to believe in Jesus, or you've heard it so many times, you're going numb to this message of the gospel. And so I want to encourage you in particular that if you're feeling that way, that you can see how Jesus responds to people like you. And these, this sermon is for you. If you're taking notes, the question we'll be answering today is, how does Jesus respond to faithless people? How does Jesus respond to faithless people? And we're going to cover this in two points. Number one, the faithless generation, the faithless generation. And number two, Jesus's response, Jesus's response. 
If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Mark chapter 9, verse 14 to 29. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. Whether you have your Bibles or not, I would like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. And we do this out of a sign of reverence and to communicate to one another that this morning we're not hearing from a person or a man, but from God himself from his word. We're going to be reading from verse 14 to 29. And as we read, just keep in mind everything that Jesus has done up to this point to evaluate whether you agree or disagree or can relate to the people in this passage. All right? This is the reading of God's word. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has cast him often into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Amen. You may be seated. If you keep your eye on verse 14 and look down, it reads that they came to the disciples. Who is they? The they refers to Jesus, Peter, James, and John, three of Jesus' disciples. And where were they coming from? If you look at verses two to nine, which is not the passage we read, Jesus took these three disciples up on a mountain and he revealed himself in a way that he's never revealed himself to anyone else up to this point. His clothes changed and became so bright that bleach wouldn't have been able to make them any whiter. In verse six, it says the disciples were terrified and speechless. They've never seen Jesus like this before. Jesus was showing Peter, James, and John that he really is who Peter says he is in Mark 8, 29. He is the Messiah. He is the promised Savior King. He is the Son of God. And he is who Mark says he is in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. He is the Christ. But again, like last week, we see Jesus tell Peter, James, and John, if you look down at verse 9, he tells them not to tell anyone about who he is until he is raised from the dead. Why? Because Jesus doesn't just want fans. He wants true followers. 
He didn't come to just heal and do miracles. He wants it to be unmistakable that he came to die for the sins of those who would believe in him. He came to save. He doesn't want people to just like his videos and watch once in a while when they get bored or when they're feeling down or they have no other option. He doesn't want people to come to him only when they can't find advice anywhere else or if they hit rock bottom. He wants people to follow him with their whole lives. He wants people who are loyal and dedicated to him and his plan. He wants people who follow him even when it's hard because they trust him. He wants people who follow him even when no one else does because they're not ashamed of him and they're thankful for who he is to them. This is the conversation that Jesus had with James, Peter, and John as they were coming back from the mountain. He revealed himself to be the Christ in the fullness of his glory, and he told them not to tell anyone for these reasons. Now, back to our passage, what were they coming back to? What were Peter, James, John, and Jesus coming back to? And this brings us to our first point, the faithless generation, the faithless generation. If you look down at the, first, uh, the second half of verse 14, it says Jesus came back and saw a great crowd. There were just a lot of people. Something was going on. They were surrounding people. And this crowd was surrounding the scribes and the other nine disciples that were left behind. The scribes who were Jesus' enemies, they were always trying to prove him wrong. They were always trying to tear his name down. They were on one side. On the other side, there were the disciples who followed Jesus, who were for Jesus, who were on Jesus' side. These two groups, the scribes and the disciples, they were duking it out, not with their fists, but with their knowledge and their words. Basically, a big debate broke out and the crowd surrounded them to see who would come out on top. Who's right? Like Jesus asked in verse 16, if you look down, you might be wondering, what were they arguing about? Keep your eyes on verse 17 to see what they were arguing about. Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And this is what was going on. While Jesus, Peter, James, and John were away, this man brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples, hoping they could remove the demon. But when the disciples couldn't do it, Jesus' opponents, the scribes, they took it as an opportunity to publicly question the authority of the disciples and maybe even the authority of Jesus. So upon finding all this out, look at Jesus' reply in verse 19. O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. So he addresses the people in the passage as a faithless generation. Those are pretty harsh words. You know, I just imagine if we think of Jesus as a God of love, we think of someone gentle, compassionate, but imagine he comes to us and he calls us, you faithless generation. So the big question is, who's Jesus talking to? Is it the scribes, his enemies? Is it the father of the demon-possessed boy? Or is it the disciples who couldn't cast out the demon? Well, in context, it could be any of them or even all of them. And it's helpful to think about why Jesus would call each person in this passage the faithless generation. And it's my personal opinion from studying this passage. People disagree, but it's my personal opinion that I think Jesus is actually addressing everyone that's here, everyone that's in the story. Let me break it down. In Mark chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus uses the same word generation to refer to the unbelieving Pharisees or his enemies. So I think Jesus is definitely addressing the scribes because they saw all Jesus did, they heard everything he was saying, and they were still actively working against him. It's not like they were curious or questioning out of curiosity, but they were arguing against Jesus, the Son of God. But I also think Jesus is addressing the father of the demon-possessed boy because even though he hopes Jesus can do something, if you look at the father's words in verse 24, he acknowledges he's faithless. 
I think he hears Jesus' words and is moved to confess his faithlessness. And finally, he's more than likely addressing his own disciples here as well. His disciples didn't, don't know it yet. They didn't quite get it yet. But Jesus is going to leave them. He's going to die. He's going to resurrect. And then he's going to go to heaven. His disciples don't know that yet. And in verse 19, when he asks how long he'll be with them, he's expressing concern and frustration for how they will deal with his absence if they can't even properly do ministry in his temporary absence while he was away on the mountain. You see, in Mark chapter 6, verse 13, it says the disciples, they were able to cast out many demons. This is not the first time the disciples were trying to cast out demons. And they were successful. But here in chapter 9, they failed. They failed. They let people down. Maybe they let Jesus down. And then when they asked Jesus at the end of the narrative, why couldn't we cast it out, Jesus? He says, this kind can only be driven out by prayer. And so what this is communicating is maybe in chapter six, because they were casting out so many demons, they were growing proud of themselves. They thought to themselves that they can cast out demons on their own power without the authority of Jesus, without prayer. They start to get cocky and they stopped praying. And that's why here Jesus is reminding them they need to keep depending on him even after the successes that they have. They probably failed because they were forgetful. They were lacking faith. They were becoming faithless. Because they experienced ministry success before, they took their eyes off of Jesus and started trusting more in themselves to be able to cast out demons, which is why they weren't able to. So everyone in the narrative is part of the faithless generation. And all of us here can relate to the faithless generation in this passage, one way or another. The question is not if you're faithless, because if you're perfectly faithful, you would not need the gospel. But all of us here are faithless, me included. But the question is, which version of faithlessness do we belong to? Do you relate most to the scribes? Maybe God has loved you your whole life, but you refuse to see it. You keep saying you'll believe only if he gives you a sign that he exists or if he writes it in the sky in the clouds or you get your Cheerios and he spells out the gospel with those Cheerios magically. But is it not enough that you were born into a Christian family? Is it not enough that even if you don't want to go to church, that you have people who love you that make sure you come out here every week so you can hear the gospel talk clearly, hoping you would be saved? Is it not enough that you have a church filled with teachers and pastors and adults that are praying for you and ready to teach you about the Bible and not in a way that sugarcoats it or waters it down, but clearly so there's no doubt as to what it is the Bible says about Jesus. Are these things not enough? But you refuse to see it. You refuse to accept it. You're hardened in your heart. Do you relate to the scribes? Or do you relate to the disciples? Maybe you are someone who believes in God, but you're forgetful just like them. You're up and down in your faith. One day you find it in your heart to be kind to the socially awkward kid, but on another day you feel completely cold and loveless, just like everyone else. One moment you're willing to do anything to follow Jesus, to tell people about him, to obey your parents, to live for him, to study his word, to pray, but in another moment, you just want to live for yourself. You've committed to following Jesus by faith, but there are many days where you take your eyes off of him and you live out of your own pride, strength, experience, knowledge, and you lean on that more than on God's grace for you. Or maybe you find confidence no longer in Jesus, but even in the good things that he's given to us, such as reading the Bible, prayer, serving, being a good son or daughter, these things are good things, but these are not things that we find confidence in. These things help us to find our confidence in Christ. Do you relate to the disciples? Or do you relate to the Father? There's a part of you that knows Jesus is right. He's the only one 
that can completely heal you. He's the only one that can forgive you of your sins and restore your purpose, direction, and meaning for life. But even as you bring yourself to him, you have doubts because no one else has been able to help you. And whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling with, seems like a lot bigger than Jesus to you, if you're honest. Or you know deep in your heart you must go to him, but for whatever reason, you can't bring yourself to. Whether it's guilt, whether it's shame, whether it's some sort of misunderstanding, whoever you relate to, I hope we can all agree that we're all in one way or another, just like the faithless generation in this passage. Considering all Jesus did in the book of Mark, considering all God has done for us in our lives, what would make most sense is for God to just give us over to our unbelief. I mean, thinking about all that God did and showed throughout the history of humanity, if we struggle still, it will be just right for God or just as good or right for God to just give us over to our doubts and our unbelief. He can say something like, you don't trust me after all I've done for you? That's fine by me. Good luck with the rest of your life. After all, that's how we often treat people. If we do everything right for someone and we love them well, but they don't respond the way we hope, we stop loving them. Maybe we can even try doing things hourly, but our hearts, we don't love them the same. But is this the way of Jesus? Is this how he responds to people who do not have faith? And this brings us to our second and final point, Jesus' response. Jesus' response. In verse 20 to 22, we see Jesus taking time to ask questions to the father about his son. But he does it with such care and compassion. And as the father answers, we get an unfiltered picture of how difficult it has been for him and his son. But focus on his request in verse 21. Look down at verse 21. But if you can do anything. Now I want to stop there. The reason this man brought his son to Jesus in the first place is because he knows Jesus' reputation as a miracle healer. And yet, he still expresses doubt. He's probably thinking, if his disciples can't do it, can this Jesus guy really do it? He doesn't fully believe Jesus is above his own disciples. He might think he's just another man. And Jesus rightfully responds in verse 23, if you can, if you can. In these few words, I imagine Jesus may be saying something like, you've seen all I've done and said. You've heard about me. Then why do you doubt me? Do you doubt my compassion? Do you doubt my power? Do you doubt me? Do you really think I can't do it? And the father must have gotten the picture very quickly because in the few words Jesus spoke, right after that, he cries out in full desperation and says, I believe, help my unbelief. Look down at verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And then Jesus, he proceeds to do what the faithless would be surprised by. You know, oftentimes I think we're surprised or shocked by Jesus' love and faithfulness because that's not how he would treat other people, but also because we lack faith and that's how he really is. But for those who have faith, full of faith, like the Syrophoenician woman from the sermon Ricky preached a couple weeks ago, they would eagerly expect Jesus to love on them. Jesus heals the man's son without delay, without difficulty. Unlike the disciples, Jesus does it easily and immediately. Now what I want to point out and what I want us to notice is that Jesus doesn't refuse to heal the man's son even after he expresses imperfection in his faith. Because I think you can see even from the man's own words that he does not have perfect faith. And this is what we would expect, right? We would expect that 
Jesus may not heal him until he has enough faith. But instead, he takes the little faith that the person has and he blesses it. You know, when I talk with some of you, some of you think you have to have some sort of perfect faith before coming to Jesus. Or maybe you're going through a particular sin struggle. You feel like you have to clean yourself up to a certain degree before coming to church. But from this story, you can rest assured that what is needed to come to Christ is not perfect faith but it's a perfect God. What is required is not perfect faith, but a perfect God. What's important is not that we have the strongest faith, but it's that we have faith in the right person. Let me give you an illustration. If you go skydiving, right, and you jump out of the plane, and you have all the faith in the world, the strongest faith in the world, that you're gonna survive when you pull the parachute. If the parachute's broken, your faith is meaningless. It doesn't matter how much faith you have. But if you jump out with a lot of fears, with a lot of doubts, and whether your parachute, of whether your parachute will work or not, but if the parachute is a good one, the little faith that you do have in the parachute or the desperation that causes you to pull it because you don't wanna die, that will save you. Friend, you do not need everything figured out right away to put your faith in Jesus. He can handle your doubts, just like he handled the doubts of the Father in the passage. He can handle your forgetfulness to, that you've placed, that to, to place your faith in him, just like he handled the forgetfulness of his disciples. He can handle all of these things. So with whatever faith you have, just come to him. You can just come to him. And when you come to him in faith, you will be raised to life. If you look down in verse 26, it says many thought that the boy was dead. He wasn't literally dead, but it was like he was dead. In the same way, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, verse one, that you were dead in the trespasses of your sins in which you once walked. You weren't literally dead. But if you're separated from God because you don't trust in Jesus, then you're separated from the source of life. And to be separated from the source of life, you can be walking, you can be breathing, but that's not life at all. You are spiritually dead. And when you're dead, you can't save yourself. You can't earn forgiveness for your own sins. It's almost as if someone who's dying on a hospital bed tries to revive themselves with CPR. You can't do that. It's as if someone who's drowning in the ocean somehow plucks themselves out of the middle of the ocean. They can't do that. Except here, when it comes to our salvation and our spiritual state, we're even, we have less hope than that because we're literally dead in terms of our spiritual status. It's only through faith in Jesus that you will be raised to life that you will be brought out of darkness to light just as Jesus was raised to life three days after his crucifixion. You're saved not based on the strength of your faith, you're saved based on the object of your faith. So friend, if you have any faith at all, bring it to Jesus and walk with him. And I wanna ask, what holds you back from coming to Jesus? What holds you back from coming to Jesus? Is it hard for you to believe that Jesus really did all the Bible says he did? Maybe you're learning things at school and you think it's incompatible with what you learn in your science classes. If you wanna believe it, but just can't bring yourself to believe it's true, then pray the words of the child's father in verse 24. I believe, help my unbelief. If you acknowledge your faith, lack of faith will bring it before God, he will never turn you away. In John 6, 36 to 37, Jesus says, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Even though we haven't seen Jesus literally in the flesh as the disciples did, we've seen him through what God has revealed to us in the word. John 1 1 says Jesus is the word. But even if you've seen and did not believe, even if you've heard the word of God and did not believe, you can still come to him. And he says in John 6, he will never cast you out. Jesus is not the type 
if you realize he was right all along and you come to him, he's not the type to say, I told you so, too late. But he will always receive you in grace. He will always receive you in mercy. And if you're faithless in any way, you can bank on this promise that Jesus will always respond in grace towards you. And this is something that's hard for us to understand because the world doesn't work this way. But God's word says, Christ will never cast you out when you come back to him. What a promise we have in Jesus. May this be an encouragement for all of us. Let's take time to pray. I wanna invite you to bow your heads in prayer. And just ask yourself and ask God to help you see what is it that holds you back from coming to Jesus? Or if you do walk with Jesus, what is it that makes it difficult or makes you struggle? Is it that you see your friends living a certain way and you want to follow after the world? Or is it that there's genuine questions and doubts that you have that you feel like no one has been working to help you answer? Or is it your sin? You know Jesus is real. You know the gospel. But when it comes for you yourself, you cannot believe that God would show you this type of grace after all that you've done, the people you've hurt, the people you've sinned against. And because of your shame and guilt, maybe that makes it hard for you to come to God. Or maybe you're here and this is your first time hearing the gospel. I mean, really hearing the gospel and paying attention to it. And maybe you just never knew about it before. But never, whatever it is, whatever it is that holds you back from coming to Jesus, use this as an opportunity to come to him. And for those of you here who feel like you're doing well in your faith, pray for your friend to your left and to your right, for maybe friends at school that you know are being held back in coming to Jesus. Pray that they would come to him confessing, I believe, help my unbelief. Let's pray these things, and then we'll sing one last song together.